Assalamu alaikum everyone. Inshallah, we'll begin in just a moment. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Uh, first of all, Eid Mubarak, inshallah. I pray that all of you had a beautiful end of the sacred month, the blessed month of Ramadan, and a beautiful um, Eid. Uh, alhamdulillah, it's a... It's been quite bittersweet for many reasons. Obviously, the month coming to an end was in and of itself bittersweet. And then many of us, I think, are also still in shock and grieving the loss of our brother, Sidi Mu'adh An-Nas, inshallah. So I wanted to just take a moment and recite Fatiha for him, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين آمين يا الله May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the highest station in Jannah al-Firdaus al-Ala and may he be united with the beloved صلى الله عليه وسلم um, he was a very dear brother, mashallah, and uh, earlier today was his janaza. So we, for those of us who may have tuned, tuned in, um, it was a very beautiful, mashallah, um, janaza. There's so many people were there, so many uh, beautiful people were there to, to make the offer him. Um, and we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give his family sabr and jameel. Uh, it's very difficult. I can't imagine a harder test than to lose a child. But subhanAllah, his parents are beautiful, righteous, God-fearing people. And from everything that has been circulating in the past few days, they've done nothing but demonstrate amazing faith and are, are really strong, mashallah. But of course, we know that grief is a very difficult, unpredictable process. And when you're surrounded by loved ones and community, alhamdulillah, it does help to carry you through. But um, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to give them that beautiful sabr and jameel uh, when all of you know the the um, the news and the this just everybody being there when, when people start to leave them and they're they're by themselves again. It's it's difficult. So our hearts are heavy for them, but alhamdulillah, you know, this is dunya. We have to, I think, just be prepared and um as you know i think every year this seems to happen almost um where some news will just will just come and completely take everyone by surprise and it's difficult but it is part of our dunya and we're in many ways um protected more so i think than previous like pre-modern people because uh sickness and illness, death were just so much more common. Uh, and a lot of parents actually, it was very common to bury children, not just a child, but children. So for us, I think because of modern medicine and a lot of the advances of our modern world, we were hit so much harder by these things because they are not as common. Of course, they still happen, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all um, strength and yaqeen and conviction and to remember that this is the temporal world um, and we're all going to leave uh, at one point or another we will leave and there is no way to determine when that is but we have um, alhamdulillah beautiful faith that gives us uh, so much clarity um, and really if you just if we just stick to our faith alhamdulillah we can get through any difficulty and challenge so may Allah make it easy for us but alhamdulillah um so as we all know we've been working on this text the foundations of the spiritual path throughout the month of Ramadan and alhamdulillah we are uh, going to continue our reading of it 
I begin, I'll begin with the dua for studying that I really encourage everyone to memorize, inshallah. Um, so I'll go ahead and recite that and then we'll begin and look at the text. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatiha lima ughliqa wal khatima lima sabaqa nasir al-haqqi bil-haqq al-hadi ila suratik al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadrihi wa miqdarihi al-azim. اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن وذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعده سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم وتجعل الحزن إذا شد سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا آمين آمين يا رب العالمين الحمد لله so بسم الله I'm gonna go ahead and screen share because I um I had a couple of things I wanted to show all of you first of all this text that we've been reading I actually didn't I forgot that I had done a infographic on Instagram on this very text um it's called the five Foundations of Faith. That's what I titled it on Instagram, but I wanted to just share it with you in case you um, wanted to maybe grab um, a screenshot of this to help you. Uh, I've mentioned it many, many times, but uh, as a visual learner, I think just seeing things laid out can make retaining knowledge easier. So for me, it works. But here is the, uh, the infographic. I'll quickly go through this. It summarizes basically the very first five uh, foundations um, and also gives us the necessary uh, questions to really self-examine, right? So first, what is a foundation? It's the lowest load-bearing part of a building, typically below ground level, and it's or it's an underlying basis or principle. So it's a beautiful word because it actually applies. We are building on this structure of faith um, that we, that's, you know, the, the objective anyway, that our, it's a lifelong process of knowledge acquisition and obviously application. So you're constantly building, you're constantly moving toward a goal of becoming a better version of yourself every day. So there's this idea of building upon something, but it's also a matter of um, establishing your principles of belief. Like, what do you believe and what are um, the ways in which you uh, manifest or represent that belief. So the five foundations, again, this is just summary for those of you who have been here uh, from the first week, but good visual to kind of see it all out, laid out. Mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala privately and publicly. Very important foundation for strong faith. If you don't do this, there's a problem, right? If you're mindful of Allah because everybody's watching you, but then as soon as you're by yourself, that's clearly an indication of spiritual disease, right? There's a problem there because if you are alone and you do nothing to remember Allah and you actually um, do you know, other things that you shouldn't be doing and you completely forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is again, indicating that there is um, spiritual affliction that you have to rid yourself of. Uh, the next is the adherence to the sunnah in word and deed. And we're going to, we, we already kind of, you know, went through each of these, but I'm just uh, reviewing it. And also I have um, people on Instagram live who are tuning in, who I'm hoping will also look at this document and really understand it. It's called the F uh, Foundations of the Spiritual Path by Sidi Ahmed Zarouk. So uh, the third point here is the um, indifference to the acceptance or rejection of others. So not being moved by whether or not people like you or not like you, because that's not, um, I mean, you know, our, the reason why we do what we do is not for the pleasure of people, it's for the pleasure of God. So that becomes your criteria, not seeking to be part of the in-group or fearing being excluded, you know, and being ostracized. Those are not motivations. Um, so really getting to that point. And then satisfaction with Allah in hardship and in ease and turning to Allah in prosperity and adversity. So those are the five foundations and here they are written out a little bit more you know um, as as you know in text form and then the questions that i uh, think are also really important for us all to ask to determine where we are with uh, in this you know spectrum of belief are important like how are you when you're completely alone um how close are you to the sunnah 
um, in, in your speech and actions? Do you talk the talk, but, but not walk the walk? How much do you care about people pleasing or being excluded? You know, does your preoccupation with people prevent you from practicing your faith authentically? And how much do you complain and whine about your life and events outside of your control? Do you resist the decree of Allah by questioning and saying things like, why me? Right? And then how often do you remember Allah when things are going well and remind yourself to be grateful? Or do you only turn to Allah when things are going bad? Right? So, um, and then we, last week, if you recall, I shared with you these uh, other visual aids to also just kind of lay out the foundations for us, inshallah. So everything we just mentioned, right? Um, what they are, the taqwa, the sunnah, the indifference, the contentment and the reliance. And then how do we get there, right? Through exalted aspirations, through Allah's reverence, through the service of others, khidmah is really important part of spiritual, um, you know, uh, purification of spiritual preparation, right? We, we, we better ourselves through the service of other people. Completing our resolves, so having goals and meeting those goals and objectives, and then magnifying our blessings, being people of gratitude. It's very important that we live, um, uh, you know, with gratitude every single day, no matter what happens. And you'll see this, you'll see people of um, faith, even when they're tested in the most difficult circumstances, you will never uh, not hear their, th them expressing their gratitude, because in their grief, in their sorrow, in their sadness, they can still uh, be filled with total gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they can, they're witnessing that they still have so many other blessings, right? So this is a very important um, quality the believer must have. And then we talked about, you know, proper conduct and how uh, one gets to proper conduct. So, you know, seeking knowledge is obviously the first point. You can't get to certain levels if you don't know what the levels are or how to even, you know, how, what they are or how to get there, right? So you need to seek the knowledge. Keeping spiritual guides is part of that, right? Where are you going to get the knowledge from? Hopefully from people who are on the path and are, are ahead of you. Uh, in some cases, you might find, you know, really uh, qualified teachers to help you. In other cases, you might uh, find other seekers on the path that are similar to you. Their students are just trying to gain more knowledge and you can come together and have circles and study from with one another. But whatever the case is to seek those out. Um, I actually had a sister message me earlier today on Instagram just saying that it's been very disheartening because she doesn't have access to female teachers. And she was just saying, expressing that she feels very weighted down by that, you know, that she doesn't have the access. And I know that there are a lot of people who are in similar situations, maybe in their region, like where they are regionally, they don't have teachers that they can access. But this is why we also have to magnify our blessings because um, alhamdulillah, the internet affords us opportunities that many of us would otherwise not have, right? We can connect with a lot of amazing people online and there are spaces for that right now what we are doing is a proof of that right um, the Rahma foundation has opened up an opportunity for us to come together on their platform using you know their platform to learn from one another and we're reading this incredible text that was translated to us by um, our, our you know modern scholars who have uh, who had access to the original arabic um, and so we're, we're doing this together. We're all students of knowledge. But this is the way that the believer, you know, they operate is that they're always, um, as they say, where there's a will, there's a way. So you seek knowledge, you seek out company, and you look for those resources. And you don't let shaitan um, get in your head and you know, dissuade you, you know, dissuade you from your path. Um, and you also other, uh, you know, things that we need to be mindful of is not also seeking out. Um, those dispensations and shortcuts in order to prevent what's necessary um, to be on the path, which is discipline, right? Disciplining uh, the nafs, getting mastery of the nafs requires hardship. And if you're always looking for the easy way out of everything, then you're really not going to, um, not going to excel. It's kind of like a student, right? If a student um, is, you know, seeking, uh, for example, 
they're, they're, they're looking to classmates for um, notes, uh, you know, cheat sheets and things that will prevent them from actually studying the text, right? Sometimes teachers will give very long um, assignments that are required of the student in order to prepare them, right, for, for the test or the exam. But a student who's not disciplined will forego, right, looking um, at the reading the actual text, even getting the book in some cases. I remember when I was in college, there were students who never paid for textbooks because they didn't want to spend their money and they would much rather just attend maybe um, any groups, study groups, or just borrow and ask other people who are taking notes to, to take their notes from them. And some people are so nice that they would share those things. But that student is not going to learn discipline. They're not going to learn. Um, they may get by because they're taking those shortcuts. But if the purpose is to gain mastery and gain real knowledge, then how are, are those shortcuts serving you? So in the same way, if you're on the path and you're immediately trying to make everything easy and cushion yourself, you know, from difficulty, then that means you're you're setting yourself up to uh, to not do very well because there is um, that that especially in the beginning, you know, you you need to sh to show up, you need to put your best effort forward, um, and then inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa taala, of course, will will bless you and things will naturally become easier. But if you're just going to start off with this attitude of wanting everything handed to you, um, it's not going to, you're not going to do very well. So that's the third um, requirement for proper conduct. And then organizing one's time. So making sure that we are really mindful of where we spend our time, what we're doing, who we spend our time with, and being unapologetic about boundaries. It's very important that we get to a point where we are comfortable um, saying no, thank you. You know, I know that there's you know, social um, considerations because sometimes we may be invited by certain people to participate, you know, in, in certain events or activities. But if it's a matter of obstructing something that you set out to do, like if you're on a path to really, for example, let's say you want to memorize something or you, you want to complete a text or you want to take a class and it's very rigorous. Um, and then in the midst of your beautiful intention, you are being invited to, um, to participate in certain activities with friends and maybe they're fun and they're exciting, but you know that it would really pull you away from your studies, right? Then you, you have to be willing to you know, respectfully decline those types of invitations and just make a, a priority that right now you're in a, a phase of your life where you're really doing something serious. And as much as you would love to, you know, clone yourself and make it, uh, make it, make it possible for you to be everywhere all at once, you simply can't do that. And so drawing those boundaries is really important. And sometimes I think uh, we let the fear, which goes back to that first foundation, right? the fear of being ostracized or not liked precede our own goals. And you see many people giving up, you know, their, their own goals because of these types of factors. So you have to take this really seriously. Then when it comes to your Dean and your path, you should be very, very um, selective and it's okay to do that. It's not, uh, it's, it's not something you should guilt yourself over. So organizing one's time. And then the last uh, part that he mentions here about um, proper conduct is suspecting the nafs, which is really important because, you know, what he's saying is that pay attention to that inner voice because the inner voice is usually dictating to us. But if we're not suspicious of the motivations of that inner voice, the source of the inner voice, then we're susceptible to falling for its tricks, right? Because it can definitely trick us. And so suspecting the nafs is, you know, it's a, it's a daily process, but it's really about the choices you make and uh, the resolves that you have and what where is it coming from, right? If you, for example, I mean, I know because I'm, I'm seeing um, already questions uh, online from various different people who are posting these things that post Ramadan, right? We're now in the post Ramadan phase. We feel the dip, right? Some of us may be feeling that sudden because we, we reached a high. We all got really excited, especially in the last 10, 
nights, but then you you kind of free fall uh, immediately after because Eid comes and, you know, I was just speaking to someone yesterday, just about food, food intake. Uh, she was saying like, my God, what happened? Like, we're all doing so well in Ramadan and all of a sudden Eid comes and it's like, suddenly all the food that you've been avoiding, it's like permissive, per, you know, per, you're permitted to once again indulge and it just, it doesn't feel good. You feel, you start to feel sick. And, you know, she was just saying that it's too much too soon. And I think a lot of us who've had maybe some Eid celebrations can acknowledge that that's true, right? We we really likely did see too much uh, uh, all of a sudden, all at once. And so similarly, you know, spiritually speaking, all those um, goals that we achieved during Ramadan, maybe we were doing so much more than we have been in the past few days. And so you start to feel like, you know, what's going on. Now the nafs right now is vulnerable. It's very vulnerable to spiritual attack because you could, you know, want to go back, you want to jump back, you know, you're, you, you fell off the wagon, as they say, and you want to jump back on, but then the nafs may start to tell you certain things like, oh, you know, it was Ramadan, and uh, Allah made it so easy, and you had the support of the masjid and the jama'ah, and now, you know, um, things are different, and then it's, it, then, then there's all these justifications that come from that, right? Like, oh, your work schedule is more intense now. Um, if you have children, you know, they're, they're, it's the end of the school year, summer vacation. So all of a sudden you're getting like all these ideas that are basically justifying you um, slowing down, right? Not really going back to that Ramadan spirit that you had. This is all from the nafs because the nafs is, and it's going to sound legitimate. And if you're really being honest, maybe some of those things are quite reasonable and fair um, and true, right? It's true that in Ramadan, we have facilitation. It's true that in Ramadan, you have you feel more supported because everybody's kind of doing things together and there's more events and there's just that vibe, right? That's all true. But when we say to suspect the nafs, that's part of examining like, you know, is it true that I, um, that, that the person that I was in Ramadan, I have to completely hit pause and then move, you know, in, in a completely different direction? Or can I maintain certain things in Ramadan that maybe, maybe I can't maintain it all, but is it kind of like this all or none narrative that I have to accept, right? That, that it was possible in Ramadan, but now that it's not Ramadan anymore, I just have to kind of, you know, move on. And um, maybe revisit that next Ramadan if Allah gives us the gift of doing that. So the nafs, like I said, will really encourage us to 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 not hit those goals and those objectives by by flooding us with a lot of justifications. But we have to be like, no, this is this is not right. I had so much hemma, I had so much hope, I had so many aspirations in Ramadan because I was feeling it. Allah was showing it to me. I need to reclaim that somehow, even if it's a part of it, even if it's a fraction of it, but not certainly not allow all these just, justifications and excuses to make me feel like I um, I don't need to, you know, I just need to kind of move on because it was just the Ramadan high. And now that it's not Ramadan, it's all good. That's just, that's a hundred percent nafs shaitan working to sabotage. And they do that quite frequently. They do it on a daily basis, but they also do it when we um, have just had this incredible month, right, of really seeing our own potential. And so right now we're vulnerable, but every day actually we're, we're vulnerable. So this is, you know, something to, to keep in mind. Now, last week, if you remember, we um, also touched upon the sicknesses of the soul and what the cures are, right? Because according to the document, right? So let me hear, for those of you who are on the Zoom call, you may recall, we went through, sorry, let me let me just expand this a little bit so you can see it better. But we went through, right, the five foundations of right conduct. And then um, then he, he brought us to this point, the foundations of what will cure the sicknesses of the soul. So this is a new now chapter in a way, right? Where he's now articulating or elucidating for us what are the ways to cure our, ourselves of sick of spiritual sickness in order to again avoid falling into these pitfalls so the first thing he mentions and i'll go back to this here is the moderation of food intake which brings us back to 
you know, Ramadan and the significance of Ramadan, because it is a very big part of why we have so much tawfiq. Um, the nafs is, you know, it's, it's like, it's a beast that resides within us and it is emboldened and empowered by food. Food is a very big part of why the nafs can bog us down because um, it's, you know, there's, it's connected, right? The, the, the mind body connection is very real and it's true. Like if you really think about um, what happens after we consume food, right? What happens is our, the, the, the digestive process is such an intense process that it takes so much energy from us that you start to feel very sluggish, especially if you've had a heavy meal. You know, if you're eating good, healthy foods, it's different, but if you're eating the typical foods uh, that most people eat, which are convenient, quick, you know, and a lot of our foods from our different respective cultures usually are quite heavy, right? So what happens is when we eat those, all that energy is focused on breaking, you know, those that food down. And then there's also the hormonal impact, right? Because we know that there's also um, a huge connection between our mental well-being and the gut flora, the microbiome, as, as they say. And I know there's many experts who speak on those issues and you can look more into that, but there is a connection of mood, of uh, just general feeling of even other mental health issues being affected directly by the stomach. So this is incredible that our scholars, you know, Imam al-Ghazali in particular and others made these connections for us, you know, over a millennia ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that the food that you eat will actually really impact your output. Um, and so when you look at your spiritual output and how much you're doing, you have to link it to the food you're eating. I mean, number one criteria is, are you eating halal food? If your food is not halal, this is a problem, right? If you're eating uh, food that's sourced from uh, haram income, or if in, in and of itself it's haram, then you likely will have spiritual affliction or other problems because you know we are commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to eat from the pure. So there's definitely a connection there. So um, that's one thing. And then the moderation aspect of it, if you're overeating, right, eating things that you shouldn't be eating, consuming to the point of just disgust, you know, and you know, it's a joke, it's a running joke, but for example, the, you know, what, what happens to people after Thanksgiving, right? The food coma that everybody falls into. And it's not just the, the tryptophan that's in the turkey. It's usually because you're eating a lot of heavy foods all at once and then there's desserts. So what happens to a lot of people is they just feel sick and then they just, you know, lay around because they can't even move. So moderation in our deen, everything is, you know, the middle way. It's, it's we are the, 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 the deen of balance. And the middle path requires that you know, and the Prophet you know, in the hadith reminds us that the stomach should be divided into three, right? Three parts, which are a third for air, right? So that you can breathe comfortably. And if you've ever eaten to your fill, that's one of the things that you have a difficulty with. You can't breathe properly because your stomach is expanded and you're actually pushing on your lungs. Like what? You know, that subhanAllah, we can, we can do that. And if you've, I mean, for those of us who've been um, pregnant before, right, you know how that feels. It's very difficult to sleep, to be comfortable in certain positions because you feel like you're suffocating, right? You have this, mashallah, uh, the baby is pressing on you. So you have to eat very, very small, especially towards the last trimester of your pregnancy, most women, right? Um, so that's a third for, for air and then a third for food and a third for drink. And you know it's sunnah also to uh, to delay the the drink part until after you've eaten. So there's all these considerations that are so beautiful because they're teaching us the importance of not giving into the nafs because ultimately that's what we're doing. We're not only potentially harming our physical bodies with too much food intake, but also we are indulging the very lowest part of us that will make it difficult for us to spiritually act right it it, it will be um it will obstruct our um 
our spiritual aspirations because we just simply don't have the energy. Uh, you've, you're just too exhausted or tired from all of that food. So moderation is really important. The second is the see seeking refuge in Allah at the onset of difficulties and challenges, right? Um, this is how we gain that mastery over the nafs, but also purify ourselves from a spiritual weakness and sickness, right? If we look to the material world, we look to people whenever things um, you know, go wrong, but we don't even think that the only one, and this is just the simple truth, who can change our circumstances is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't think to turn to him. Um, that, that means that there's a misunderstanding. There's, there's a misalignment. There's something off about one's understanding of the way the world works, right? Because Allah is the source of all blessings, 100%, without a doubt. He's also the source of our tests. So you have to know, and this is why going back to the original five foundations, it is very explicitly stated that we turn to him, right, in both situations, um, in hardship and in ease. Like we have to have that reliance on Allah. So seeking refuge, this is training yourself. This is getting into a habit where immediately when something, uh, you hear difficult news, um, you immediately just turn to Allah. You know, hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. La hawla la quatala bila. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. All of these are taught to us to know how to process um, difficult news, whether it's directly impacting us or other news that we may hear of loved ones and people that we care about. But it's just immediately seeking that strength, that support in Allah and not falling apart, you know, because. Uh, some some people who don't think to turn to Allah uh, can let you know their emotions get the best of them, and then you know there's a lot of uh, further problems that come from that. So this is just training yourself that no, I immediately need to know what to say, how to say it. Some people, mashallah, immediately will fall in you know in sajda, um, asking Allah whether you know it's it's just seeking strength from Him or. Um, protection is seeking refuge in him for, if, from whatever it is, but they know to do that because they've been taught that that's how you respond to, to difficulties and challenges. So this will help one to, to cure those, those illnesses of the soul. And then avoiding haram places. So we talked a lot about this last week as well, that in order to, um, you know, really prevent yourself from relapsing or falling into sinfulness, you have to cut yourself from the source. And so cutting from the source is examining who and where is it that I start to fall short? Is it certain people that are too overpowering? Um, and if your temperament is you are, you know, a more uh, mild mannered, quiet person, you're, you're kind of, you know, um, a little bit, you know, you're, you're, le you're, you're less likely to maybe speak up because you don't, you know, want to um, disrupt things. And some people, this is just temperamental, um, very agreeable person, then you might need to examine your circle of influence and friends, because maybe they are so overpowering in terms of the way they are. There's a lot of pushovers, you know, people who are easily pushed over. Um, and it's not, uh, and, you know, that's, that's a beautiful, and in some cases, it's a beautiful quality, because you know, the, op the, al the alternative in some cases is, the, you know, to be overbearing and, and, and difficult, right? And so if you're mild mannered, it's, it's a beautiful quality, but you also have to know the, the, the limit, right? Because part of um, the spiritual diseases is something that we call blameworthy modesty, right? That when you're, you're shy to speak up, even when something is really clearly wrong, for yourself or other people, this would be considered a spiritual disease. So you have to know that if someone is pulling you into different directions, or maybe their company, you just find that every single time you're around them, um, the energy is really negative. Maybe they gossip a lot. They talk about people. They're just, they don't really have a lot of good to say. They curse a lot. They use foul language. They speak about things that are just not very beneficial. Um, then you have to have the emotional intelligence to be able to slowly remove yourself from their influence in a, in a very considerate way, because we are not um, 
uh, encouraged to, you know, we don't need to be dramatic about things like this. You know, if you, if you need to create a boundary with someone, there's no need to be dramatic and cause a scene and hurt people and then make it this huge, um, very, um, it is because it's quite nefsy to do that, right? To, to kind of center yourself as though um, you're, you're so above other people and that you can't, I can't be around you anymore. You're not a good influence. This is, this is not wise. We shouldn't do that, but you can certainly um, explain very, you know, carefully to people that you're on a different trajectory. You know, like I'm just working on myself. I need some time away. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. But for right now, I'm I'm really busy. I have some other projects in in the pipeline, or something that indicates to your these people that right now, and maybe you know, it's open ended. Um, you're just not able to participate in whatever it is that they're inviting you to. And that slow withdrawal really will help you to avoid, again, the people and the places that are causing or potentially causing you to continue to sin, be in, be in a state of sinfulness. So that that's a very like you know, direct way of dealing with external negative influences. But you also have to be mindful of your own habits, right? Your own um, tendencies, because we can't blame everything on everybody else. So if you yourself have weaknesses to being in certain environments, um, you know, FOMO is a very real thing. And there are people who are afflicted with this feeling of, I have to go because I don't want to be the only one that's not going. And then I won't, you know, have, it's, that's what it is if you're missing out. So if you, um, if that's coming from you, right, maybe you're invited to something and all your friends are going, and this is, you know, during a time where you had intended to, to do something else. Like, let's say, for example, I mean, I'm just going to try to give you a practical example. Let's say, for example, there is a weekend retreat coming up and it's going to be a really great spiritual weekend. There's some teachers coming to your area. They're going to put a program together. You buy your tickets, you register, you're ready to go. But then on one of those nights, some of your friends um, decide that they want to go to the city, whatever major city is in your area, and they want to have dinner and maybe, you know, have have some other social, um, there could be some other social thing they want to do, but they're inviting you to that and all of your other friends and maybe even really close people are going to go and now you're getting phone calls and text messages let's go together let's hang out let's all carpool and you now are in a bind because you it's coming from you there's no real pressure necessarily but you yourself are now like oh i'm torn i really wanted to go to this i bought my tickets but then at the same time everybody's going to this big shindig or whatever it is you know everybody's going to be there and then i'm going to be the only one left out um and you have to make a decision and it is it's kind of one of those dunya versus deen decisions that you might find yourself in but if you are really thinking with your rational mind not your emotions not your appetites with your rational mind you're weighing between the two and this is why it's so important to like, again, suspect the nafs, because the nafs is going to give you all the justifications for why you should go. You know, all your friends will be there, your siblings, your cousins, whoever. You're going to have an awesome time. You can't be the only one left out. It doesn't look good. It doesn't reflect well. Blah, blah, blah. Right? It's going to fill you with all these justifications. But you have to activate the rational mind and say, I had a really beautiful intention. Allah inspired me to go and do this spiritual weekend retreat with amazing scholars who I don't know if they're ever gonna, you know, like when 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 it would be possible for me to have this opportunity again. And um, there's gonna be obviously more, more barakah there because if I'm in this environment, I'm gonna be remembering Allah. I'm gonna be doing my prayers. I'm gonna be listening to Quran. I'm gonna be listening to the I'm gonna be around people who are beneficial to me, inshallah. And as much as I would love to be in this social place where I can get dressed up and kind of have fun and do whatever I do with my friends, if I'm being honest, that environment, I'm going to be forgetful of Allah. I'm probably not going to do all my prayers because you know how it goes once you're out and about and um, you're not in an environment where those things are easy to do, then 
it just becomes qada or oh, oh well, I guess um, I just won't pray this time. And th these are the kinds of options that eventually what happens, right? That's the real way of examining your choices, which is what are which one is better for me? Rational mind has to be operating here. The mind, not the heart, not the emotions, and not the appetites. And that level of just, I mean, that level of awareness of your of your um your your you know these choices that are you're being presented with and your own mind and suspecting the mind will help you hopefully make the right decision. So you have to do that though. So when we say avoiding haram places, it's it's very much um, the onus is on the individual to do that. And then continuous toba and keeping company of the rightly guided. So those are all part, those are all regular actions that we should be constantly doing in order to prevent the illnesses uh, of the soul from increasing, exacerbating, because we need to constantly be working on cleansing the heart and the soul. But if we're doing uh, you know, these things and not mindful of them, then it's when it, will we ever get to the a place of like some level of peace, right? Uh, how, how will we arrive at that place of, of soul uh, tranquility if we're constantly, um, you know, uh, in, in this position of, of disease taking over and we're not really working on cleansing. So all of this is to help. And this is what we talked about last week. Now, um, the next, if you look at underneath here, right, you'll see, because he he mentions this actually you know what let me let me go to the next slide because at the end of last week if you remember right before we ended here he says i say um it's this last paragraph on page 10 i say that being content with the self persisting in disobedient acts and abandoning awareness of allah are the foundations of all illnesses tribulations and pitfalls so this is, you know, Sidi Ahmed Zaruk, he's basically giving us the answers in this small little chapter, I mean, a paragraph, where he's telling us that everything that we want to rid ourselves, all these spiritual illnesses, and then also the hardships that we want to prevent, right, the tribulations that we want to prevent, nobody wants to be tested and tried in dunya, um, and the pitfalls that we keep falling into, can be sourced back to these three things. The first is being content with the self, which is why he mentions right before this, you have to be suspicious of the self. You can't be content with the self. If you let that inner voice dictate to you all the time without challenging it with the rational mind, without um, you know, questioning its presumptions or its intentions or whatever it is, and you just allow yourself to always do whatever your your you know whatever you're compelled to do without first examining the uh, motivation behind it. It's 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 going to cause you problems because many people fall into um, a lot of problems in their life because they didn't take the time to first suspect the intentions of their their own inner voice. Right. Um, and they just they're too confident, basically, in their own judgment. They're too confident in their own assessments of things. Right. Many, many of us will make um, uh, assessments and judgments of people, of situations without even all the evidence. Like it's snap judgments. How many of us fall into snap judgments all the time? And then we act upon those snap judgments. Right. Uh, we let the emotions dictate. So this is where it's so important that you are not content with the self, that you actually look at yourself as being a source of a lot of your problems. And I mean, our scholars, they didn't mince words. They were very clear that the greatest of the four evils of this dunya is the nafs. So if you're not suspicious of your own nafs, you know, because it's very easy for us to look outwardly and be suspicious of other people. And we're all like, mind readers amazingly you know when we when we presume to know a person's intentions you know i bet you i know why she did that or why he said that we all seem like we got everybody figured out but we are clueless about the machinations of our own nafs right which is why um a really great book that um alhamdulillah our teachers uh, you know sheikh hamza and others have recommended for decades like i remember decades ago he he encouraged people to read it. And I love this book. Um, he recently did a reading of it 
on the First Command Book Club, which is the Screw Tape Letters. So if you have never read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, I really recommend reading that. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's not my recommendation, but it's the recommendation of uh, many teachers, but I have also read it and I find that it is a really great in, insight uh, or provides a lot of insight into these um, internal dialogues that we have that are actually sourced from, uh, you know, these, the external evil of Iblis's waswasa with our own nafs working, you know, together because they are, they're like co, co-conspirators against us. Uh, so it's, it's a dialogue between Iblis and one of his uh, minions and how they basically um, trick us as human beings. So, but, but it's just, it's very insightful. Um, and then there's also, um, I think it's Ibn Josie's book, The Devil's Dupery, which is, um, forgetting the name in the Arabic, uh, it's, it's a text as well, on the, the way that shaitan tricks the human being. And it's amazing, amazing text. Um, so the, there are books within our own tradition that I think once you read it, you're just going to be like, subhanAllah, I have been fooled for so long thinking that, you know, I was applying logic or I was, you know, being fair when I really wasn't, when it was really very self-serving, right? Because a lot of our, our thoughts are actually very self-serving thoughts. Um, and we will convince ourselves because um, there's a lot, there's, well, well, it seems like logic, but it's not really, it's just nafsi uh, justifications. So, um, and this is actually why it's also important. I mean, this is a total different topic, but I actually did want to share this with you because just to make this point. So let me, um, let me add this image. I hope I can add it. You know what? I think I need to, um, yeah, I won't go into a tab, but let me uh, quickly stop this screen share and share this image with you because I think this is one of the best images I've seen on cognitive distortions. Um, Bismillah. So look at this image. This is this is just enough. I think if you if you took time to study this, and this is you know um, from from modern psychology, but a lot of these things, what what it does is it helps you understand how your own mind can mess with you, which from a metaphysical lens, from our perspective, this is a very material scientific approach to understanding the distortions of the mind. But from our lens. The distortions of the mind can be con attributed to the nafs and shaitan, right? Um, so for those who are on Instagram, let me see, how can I get you to see the same image? Because I wish I could, I don't know how to do these things like while I'm on the call with you, if there's a, uh, see, they don't have an image share, which, which is unfortunate, but the Zoom call is through Rahma Foundation if you want to jump on, but otherwise you can go to, um, you know what, do this, go to Google and do a search for cognitive distortions examples. Um, and the website is called Mind My Peelings. It's, it's uh, I don't know what, anyway, it's, it's not feelings, it's peelings with a P, P-E-E-L-I-N-G-S. But it should come up. It's an image that I, I just found on Google. Um, but I think it's a great image because Everybody should know these things. What's polarized thinking? What's mental filtering? Uh, Overgeneralization, jumping to conclusions, right? Mind reading, fortune telling, which I mentioned, catastrophizing, um, magnification, minimization, personalization, blaming. I mean, if you just took some time and you're honest with yourself, right? And you really ask yourself, how often do I do these things? You're going to hopefully have a total different understanding of the mind. And how um, how your how you should not trust your mind so quickly, which is why it's so important to have good sahaba. Because if you have teachers, you have good people, then when you get like a solid, firm, you know, um, idea about something, it's really good to to check that with someone who can be honest with you, who'll tell you objectively. Mm, I don't know if that's if I would do that, or I don't know if I agree with that, you know, I think, I think you're, you might be getting ahead of yourself. Um, you know, you might be overgeneralizing, or you might be doing this or that. 
But being suspicious of the nafs, that's what it looks like. It's not believing everything that your mind tells you. And, you know, there's a fine line. We also don't want to uh, become paranoid of every single thought and idea we have. That's not the point of this. The point of this is to just be really clear about the, the way that our stream of consciousness is influenced, right? Because there are multiple things that influence our thoughts. Um, so we have the, the four khawatir in our tradition that explain, you know, the sources of inspiration for the human being. Like what, what inspires the human being? Um, it's your nafs, your own self, your own ideas, your own desires, your whims, your um, iblis, because he is, that's one of the characteristics and qualities, major ones that he has, is he can't directly force us to do anything. We are responsible for our own actions. However, he can suggest, right? He can suggest. Um, Alhamdulillah. So I'm sorry, someone's asking on the Instagram. Yes, mind my peelings with an S.com and then do a search for cognitive distortions examples. Sorry, it's very wordy, but cognitive distortions. I'm going to just quickly try to type this cognitive distortions um examples that's the name of the image it's got yellow little um pictures on it that and then there's seven qualities that they um, teach you really great and i think you should look, look this over and examine it really well um so yeah that you know that it, once you once you uh do this then you'll just be more suspicious of of what's going on why why am i thinking this way and um, then you check, you know, you, you contrast those ideas that you have with your conscience, which should hopefully be rooted in your taqwa, right? That I have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if I'm thinking this way or I want to do this, what would be more pleasing to Allah? That is the, the, the constant state of the believer. That, you know, you have an impulse, you have a desire, you have a thought, but then you, you weigh it with that scale of, is this going to be, um, is this going to yield the ridha of Allah or his displeasure? And that's, then you act, right? So the other two sources are the Khatar Malikani, which is from, you know, the angelic presence um, that we have angels all around us that are assigned to us to protect us. I think um, there's 10 of them, if I'm not mistaken, um, that, that are assigned to us. And they're on either side, in front of us, behind us, above us, there's a two on our shoulders. So we have angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, and they will sometimes inspire us to act, inshallah, always in, in khair. Um, and then we have the Khatar Rabbani, which is the, you know, in, the direct um, communication or inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which, which uh, Allah will add exactly how uh, or in what context that can come. But I think I've heard some, for example, uh, explain that our answers to our istikhara, which are directly, we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, you know, for guidance on a certain matter, um, then he will guide us. It could also be dreams because dreams are part of revelation, right? So there's certain ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, will communicate things to us as well. But these are the four sources. So what this does is it helps you to just suspect is which source is a certain thought or idea coming from. And, and that's why it's so helpful. So this is a really great, and I hope you, those of you who are on the Zoom call, I hope you got the um, screenshot or at least, you know, saw it. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing this and then we can go back to and I'll stop soon so we can take some Q&A, inshallah. So this is what he ended on, um, or what we ended on last week, which was the sources of all illnesses. So being content with the self, persistent disobedience. So if you are persistently being disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah, you're going to have spiritual illness. You're going to have tribulations. You're going to continue to fall. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Because why would you expect facilitation and ease and guidance and benefit and blessings, although Allah is so generous because he's, by the fact that we breathe, by the fact that we eat, by the fact that we have a roof over our heads, we have sustenance coming to us, we're still in blessing. We're, so it's not like we're completely cut off when we turn from him. I mean, even those who deny him and reject him are still being sustained by him. And that's out of his generosity. But 
if you want ease and you want to be protected against these types of things, then you have to have, again, the mindset or the just the, the conscience to know and the logical mind to know that um, sinfulness is going to, uh, it, it has to stop. You have to stop your sinfulness uh, in order to be protected. So that's the second thing. And then the, la the third thing that he mentions is abandoning awareness of Allah. Um, so when we are in ghafla, which all of these things lead to, if you're content with yourself, you're persistently uh, disobedient and doing sinfulness knowingly, like you know what you're doing is haram, but you continue to do it anyway, then it will lead you to a state of ghafla, which is abandoning awareness of Allah, where you're not thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're not remembering Allah. So you will, again, have a lot of problems. It's just, that's the recipe for disaster. So he says all of our illnesses, our tribulations and pitfalls can be rooted to one of these three or all of these three. So really important, uh, mashallah, uh, wisdom here. And then for just in a few couple of minutes, actually, wow, subhanAllah, today's session went so quickly, I apologize. But um, this is what was the next section, which are the other afflictions and pitfalls of the soul. So he's giving you the three that are, he believes, the root of a lot of the evil and the hardships that we experience. But now he's also mentioning that there are other pitfalls that usually people who are spiritually ill will fall into. First is that they prefer ignorance over knowledge. So there is this idea and tendency for some people, right? Ignorance is bliss, where they don't want to know. They are willfully ignorant. They don't want you to teach them about right and wrong. They don't want you to correct them when they make mistakes. These are the type of people that shun, um, you know, Nasiha. So, and you might know people like this, like they, they'll be doing something wrong and you want to advise them. But when you advise them, they're just like, oh, no, I don't want to hear that right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. And they kind of play it off because they're, they'd rather not know. Um, and if you think about the day and age that we live in, Allah, but I don't think many of us are going to be able to get away with the whole, I was ignorant card. You know, just think about the level of uh, access to information that we have. It's unprecedented. If you just rewind 50, 60 years ago, you, a person, in order to really learn their deen, they would have to travel. They would have to go out of their home, make a trek sometimes to find qualified teachers. It was a much more involved process. Whereas now, knowledge within a split second you could access major databases and sources of information. And so it really comes back to the individual volition and desire of all of us. If you are you know, a student and you're, or you're working and you're constantly um, you know, reading for your work or your studies because of your, you know, you're, you're still in school and you're, or you're just online and you're watching videos and looking at news articles and following blogs and whatever you're doing, that's all you actively pursuing knowledge, but it's just not the knowledge that will lead you to the knowledge of God, right? In most cases, because it's material knowledge. So how then can a person who has the access, who has the means, who has the ability, because you are, you know, you, you, you're Obviously, um, you're you're able to read. You know, you're you're educated enough to do that. So you have all of these things. How then can you act as though you didn't know? Other than the only explanation being you chose not to know. You chose instead of um, learning your dean to go and memorize song lyrics. And you know, there there are people who will do this. They they will not know Quran. They will not prioritize the, their knowledge of deen, but they can memorize many other things and they will be very proud, whether it's a person who's like a sports um, buff and they know all the stats of their favorite athletes, or they will, I mean, I know people who love movies to the point that they will memorize dialogue of like a, the whole movie. They'll know it back and forth. So, okay, so you can clearly... Uh, you know, you have the time and you have the, the ability, but your what is dictating? Because if it was your rational mind, we go back to that equation, right? If your rational mind is dictating to you, 
then you see your brain cells, your memory, your, uh, your, your mind, basically like real estate, right? Because once you're, you know, you choose to, to make those uh, connections, right? In your brain and you choose to, uh, to distribute your, your, your uh, brain cells to certain skills or whatever it is, um, it's, it's like real estate that you've, you've built upon. So if you're really mindful of that, then you would say, I can either spend a lot of my brain energy and, you know, time and money maybe doing this, which will make me maybe feel good or feel some, you know, nefsi kind of impulse in me, or I can think about the long-term benefit and investment of learning something for the sake of Allah. And this doesn't mean that we can't also learn other things outside of deen. That's not the point here. The point is having the discernment to know what is in your best interest, in your, in your soul's best interest, versus what indulges your nafs. And if you can do that, then you will be able to make the right choices when you're presented with options. But if you're not even thinking on that higher level, right, you're not pushing yourself to higher goals and standards, then what will happen is your emotions and your appetites will dictate for you, which is why we have to be what suspicious of the nuts of the thoughts of the nuts. So this first point, preference over uh, of ignorance over knowledge is really important. A lot of people will present with this. Being deluded by spiritual imposters. This is also another sign of spiritual um, uh, you know, sickness and also susceptibility to pitfalls is that you, because you don't have discernment, you're not aware of what, what is true and what isn't, and you're kind of in that you know, you're just letting your emotions get the best of you, then you may very easily fall for people who come, you know, with all the right things to say, right? The same way, for example, you know, a, a hopeless romantic can be easily swept off their feet because they're not thinking with their logical, rational mind. They're thinking, they're allowing their emotions to get the best of them. So if you have um, the ability, or if you've studied your dean and you see, or you're around really God-fearing people, then you can look past the performativity that usually comes with spiritual imposters, because a lot of them are just performance artists. I mean, I wouldn't even call them artists. They're just performers. They come, they, they look the part, but they're not, um, you know, they're not sincere because there's, there's a, there's a lot of odious behavior that they present, you know, being overly, um, almost to a point of, you know, just uh, repulsion, um, being too, um, what's the word, like, you know, there, there's too much uh, uh, performance, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm this very, very um, humble uh, person, and I, I lower myself to everyone, and I, I speak in a way that's just, you, I think we've all been around people like that, right, where it's just, it doesn't feel right, and if you look at the Prophet, I said, I mean, he's our exemplar, you, you show one hadith where he or any of the great Sahaba or any of the great scholars of our time ever um, humiliated themselves or, or made themselves look to um, in a way that was just not befitting. You know, there's a, there's a very fine line between humility and, and looking um, and, and humiliating yourself. We don't, we don't, as Muslims don't do that. You're supposed to hold yourself up with dignity and with honor, not because you think of yourself as anything, but it's rather the, the way that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to be, right? That's why we're upright, right? We're not like animals on the floor. Um, so when you see that kind of, there's a specific term for it, and I can't remember it right now, but anyway, it's to describe people who are just very, very, um, uh, affected, I think, is is one of the ways to describe them. But it looks like basically they're just acting, and it's not real. So you, you would be able to see that. But if you're, you know, um, easily deluded because you're, and there are there are these gurus, for example. Like I remember, I went to um, a, an Oprah Winfrey event here. Like I don't know, it was 2014. So it was a while ago, almost 10 years ago, and. Oh my gosh, this is what I, I'm, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen these people, they come on stage and they just act like they're these highly, um, you know, spiritual, like they've reached nirvana, the way that they act and the way that they carry themselves. Uh, and you should just see past it. A lot of them are just, they're grifters. They make money off of making claims. Um, a lot of them are just not real 
uh, you know, they, they, a lot of them steal, like it's known, um, you know, some of the people that she's platformed have been proven later to be just people who take from the tradition, the great, the great traditions, they'll actually say it like they, they basically borrow from all of the great world religions, and then they write their little books, and it's next thing you know, it's on the book club, or it's all over the bookstores, and they're, um, they're, you know, lauded as being these spiritually enlightened, mystical individuals, but it's like, please, so you can see people like that as for what they are, whereas, mashallah, some of the greatest scholars of our time were so humble that, you know, people didn't even know uh, that they were talking to them sometimes. Like Imam al-Ghazali has, you know, many uh, great stories about when he was sweeping, you know, uh, I don't know if it was Baghdad or Syria, but he was sweeping the mosques of, of you know, the great mosques. And because he had reached the height of scholarship, there were circles of, of scholars and students of knowledge talking about him. But you know, this was before pictures were available, so they didn't even know what he looked like. But he's just so humble. He didn't say a word. He just was, because he had his own journey with Allah. So our tradition is full of stories like of people like that, saint, saintly people who are not interested in trying to impress people. They didn't do the whole sycophant kind of weird, like I said, performativity that you'll see from a lot of these people. And they didn't center themselves. It was never about that. It's always about the deen, about Allah, about the Prophet Sallallahu So that's how you can pr protect yourself from being deluded by those types of imposters. And then the inability to prioritize important matters. Again, if you're um, not spiritually right and following the tradition and following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then your whole life will be kind of all over the place. You won't make good decisions. You don't have that wisdom and discernment. So you may just prioritize the wrong things and you end up foregoing really important things like your prayers for other things that are of no benefit to you. Something as, as so obvious as what could be more important than praying because that is the reason why you were created. There's nothing more important in your life that you do as a human being, as a Muslim, nothing more important than your prayer. Um, but if you have to be told that and you have to be convinced of that, then there's something you need to examine within yourself because your priorities are off. Like if you think your work is more important than your prayers, that's a huge problem because who is the one who's sustaining you? Who's the one who got you that job? Who's the one that is allowing that income to come to you? It's your Lord. So you think that by bypassing the worship of your Lord to get to your job on time or to, to you know, to do your work that that is a wise thing to do? I don't know. I just think, again, activate the rational mind. You'll see that that just doesn't logically follow. And then using, using spiritual path to inflate the nafs. This is also another problem that for a person who's afflicted with diseases, they would uh, start to see, uh, you know, getting into, you know, these types of spiritual, um, uh, you know, endeavors as being a means to, uh, to benefit themselves. Like I said, grifting or just, you know, benefiting, profiting off of off of spirituality is a is horrible, and it's it's the lowest thing to do. And then wanting to expedite spiritual openings without the prerequisite effort. So this is also another pitfall that a person who is not on the right path, who is afflicted, would want to experience things really quickly. And I've heard from many people, some people, for example, who have a difficult time sustaining their worship because they're waiting for I don't know, like the sky to open up and the angels to descend, but they're waiting for like these signs. And it's almost like in their mind, until they feel like, you know, these openings um, that they just don't really feel like it's working. Like I've actually had people say that, like, I don't know, I don't really feel very motivated in my prayers. I'm, I don't feel anything. I'm like, okay. So in order for you to continue to pray, you have to feel something first. How about seeing it as the opposite, that maybe if you continue to put that effort in uh, to whatever act of worship you're supposed to be doing, that eventually, because of your sincerity and your effort, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward you with, um, with, with things, you know, like if, you, if you're not seeing dreams, like some people, for example, they may want to do dhikr or salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu because they want to see him in their dreams. So is that um, is that now the only motivation that you have to do salawat on the Prophet Is that oh I want to see him in a dream? That you have to 
you know, really, again, suspect your intentions and be like, wait a second, you know, I should be doing salawat on the Prophet just because Allah commanded us to do it. He does it, the angels do it, we do it, right? Um, why am I making these conditionals, right? If I'm making conditionals, then that's clearly an issue. But this is how the nafs can really um, trick us and delude us is by putting all these ideas in our minds. And unless we're suspicious of it, then we're susceptible to it. So mashallah, I know that I'm really over and I apologize for that. But let me go ahead and stop screen share, see if there's any comments um, or questions. I see one qu question in the Q&A box, but I don't think there's anything in the chat going on. And um, Asada Fadwa had a prior commitment, so she's not here to to moderate, but let me go ahead and read this. Could you recommend some books that you think reading would improve our deen or enlighten us toward our deen? Looking at things to head while I'm working, cleaning, driving. Mashallah. Jazakallah khairan for this question. I mean, I think, um, you know, some of the books that, uh, you know what I would really recommend actually, because uh, to, to, you know, populate a list right now offhand uh, is difficult, but I do think that, mashallah, if you're not familiar with um, the First Command Book Club, that Sheikh Hamza is doing with Zaytuna College, I would really recommend people to look at that uh, program because he has hand selected very specific texts to really open our minds up and to um, enhance our understanding. And they're they're all over the place. I mean, I, I mean, in terms of genre, so it's not like uh, one specific genre. He he has a lot of non-Muslim authors, um, a lot of novels, nonfiction, but everything that he's curated is actually, and if you follow the recordings that he's put together, um, they are really quite spiritually insightful. I mean, there's not a single book that he's picked that hasn't left the, you know, the, the group anyway, because you can, you know, we have Q&A and there's a lot of discussion in the chat. Everybody's like, wow, 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 because it's it's done with a lot of depth and insight into what we, the modern Muslim, need to do in order to really elevate our understanding, increase our understanding, and hopefully, inshallah, um, you know, just spiritually uh, grow and benefit from. So I would say definitely look at that. Um, it's called the First Command Book Club. Just go to zaytunacollege.edu. You'll see the, the link for it. And you can, they actually have a list of the, the titles uh, for, for last year and this year. Just look at it. Um, there's a lot of great selections. And I mentioned, you know, the screw tape letters, but I would say purification of the heart for sure, because Tuskia is a lifelong process. It's something we should all be doing. And if you're not even aware of your own spiritual illnesses, it's kind of like um, getting a blood work analysis, right? Before you get on a path of like a total new lifestyle change. Most people, that's what they do. If you want to have a total, um, you know, like you want to renew your, your health or, or revitalize your health, this is, is what may be encouraged of you, right? Go to your doctor, get some blood work, see what's going on. And then you start to plan ahead, right? Once you look at your numbers. Um, so in a way, when you look at your um, the purification of the heart, when you're examining your spiritual diseases, it's the same thing. I need to know what I'm working with, like which diseases... Um, you know, do I need to, uh, to work on more than others? And that's why there it's, it, it covers the signs, the symptoms, and then the cures. And so I would definitely do that. Um, I think also connecting with, uh, I mean, there's, there's things that we do like prayer, reading the Quran, um, Sira and Dhikr that are kind of like just givens every single day, I have a portion of it the same way you would like taking really potent spiritual uh, vitamins or like, you know, to, to basically inoculate yourself or, you know, from diseases and from problems outside. Prayer is part of that. Uh, reading the book of Allah, doing our daily awrad or duas. That's all to protect the heart and our, shield ourselves from the external, you know, world and the problems here. So that we do those no matter what. And then there's additional things where it's like you're really trying to grow your understanding. And that's where looking at your aqida, looking at, you know, the at the nafs, um, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, I mean, obviously we should be, we should know our, our farba'ayn. So if you're, if you haven't studied like the fiqh of, you know, tahara, the fiqh of prayer, just the basic fiqh that you would need, your, you know, your daily um, life fiqh, those are important. 
but I think that's a good place to start in terms of you know what to read. Uh, so sorry, long answer to the question, but alhamdulillah, I hope that's helpful to you. And then um, let me see. I don't I don't see any other questions in the chat. So unless there are any questions, I think we can go ahead and end for today, inshallah. I will look quickly over at Instagram because I see, mashallah, a lot of people are coming in and out and I don't know if there are any questions. So let me just check. Um, uh, yes, Sister uh, Fatima, I was speaking about the book club that um, is on uh, Zaytuna College's website, Eid Mubarak. Oh, thank you, mashallah. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan for some of the, the comments here. I don't see any questions yet. So I think we can go ahead and end today's session. Inshallah, next week we will um, Bismillah, we will continue the text. So for those who are on the Instagram live, I'm actually doing a class with the Rahma Foundation. We started it in the month of Ramadan, but we're continuing it until we finish this text. It's called Foundations of the Spiritual Path. It's open, it's free. There's no commitment other than just a registration. But it is an incredible text that is um, uh, written by Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and it's really a roadmap for the believer on how to build your, your spiritual path in a very smart way, mindful of all of the pitfalls and the dangers within and externally. So it's a beautiful document, and we've been going over it for four or five weeks now. We'll continue, inshallah, next week. I want to thank everyone for being part of the session today. Oh, wait, is there another question? Alhamdulillah. Yes, Jazakallah uh, khair and sister. The recordings will be available. Um, I believe the Rahma Foundation it will send a link to the recordings um, after the class is over. So just check your email. They usually upload it to the cloud and then um, send the recording. So inshallah, you can check it out there. Um, and then we'll continue next week, same time, Monday, 5 to 6 p.m. Well, 5 to 6, 20 p.m. today, but hopefully we'll, I'll try to keep it under an hour next week. And uh, I invite you to read the document ahead of time and prepare any questions in advance. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah, I'll go ahead and end in dua. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalwa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad. صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone inshallah we'll see you next monday please keep again city uh, muaz and nas and his entire family in your duas inshallah and uh, the community worldwide these things um, are really hard sometimes for for, for many people but inshallah, Allah give us strength that we just had a blessed month of Ramadan. And even though it's very difficult to bear such losses, we have to keep in mind that alhamdulillah, this is dunya. Inshallah, we'll all come out on the other side in a much better state, reunited with our loved ones. Inshallah, ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. Again, jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.